<coughs> Welcome. Thanks to everybody for coming out tonight. I am very pleased to uh, continue our Lenten presentations tonight with a presentation on Mary, the hand that leads us to Christ, uh, brought to us by our own associate pastor, Father John Martinez. Good evening. That's kind of loud. Um, I'm glad that you had the opportunity or took the time to, to be here, to be present uh, here with us. Also, those who are joining us uh, virtually, I thank you for taking the time to, to just have a moment uh, to reflect, to know a little bit more about Mary or maybe be reminded of how much Mary, uh, how Mary is, is so important in our lives. And as we plan this uh, talk today, uh, we did not know exactly what uh, topic we should be talking about until somebody told me, you should talk about Mary. And I was like, yes, I love Mary. She's a very uh, very important person in, in my life of devotion. Um, somebody that I look up to, I will say, all the time. Uh, not perfectly, but I, I do so. So uh, thank you for being here. Um, what I'm going to share with you is kind of like, a reflection of who Mary means to me and how a little bit she has led me to uh, closer to Christ, but maybe how has she lead or how she leads us all uh, to Christ. That's her mission, leading us to to her son, that, that author of life who, who comes to, to save us. So in order to, to start, let's start with a prayer. And this prayer, I have heard it many, many times before, but never pay attention to it until I started preparing for this talk. And it truly, like, it truly touched me when I, when I read it. And therefore, that's why I want to start our, our evening with this prayer. <clears throat> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remember... O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, we fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do we come, before thee we stand, sinful and sorrowful, O Mother of the Word incarnate. Despite not our petitions, but in thy mercy, hear and answer them. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> As I was saying, Mary has occupied a special place in my heart and in my spiritual life. And I believe I learned this from, from my family, especially from my grandparents. I always saw my grandmother pray in the rosary multiple times times a day, maybe up to three times that I'm aware of. And she will walk all the way around the house and even in the backyard, just constantly praying the rosary every single day. But I also saw my, my grandfather praying the rosary every single day when he came after work. The first thing as he arrived home was to go into his room sit down on his bed, and just take the rosary and pray. Have his time to be in union with God. And through them, I understood that the rosary, uh, I understood the rosary to be like the phone book or the phone that connected them directly to God. Through the rosary and while praying <clears throat> together with Mary, they gave thanks to God for what they have lived throughout the day, and they were asking also the Lord for his blessing and care for the next day. <clears throat> and it is for this reason that I usually begin my prayers by inviting Mary to pray with me. I personally have adopted that practice of my grandparents, if you wish, of picking up the phone and talking directly, making the call, but this time through Mary. And it is hard to explain, but 
For me, as soon as I know that Mary is praying with me, when I have that faith, that she is picking up those, those prayers, those intentions that I raise to the Lord, I have the certainty in faith that the Lord, her son, is listening to me. And maybe the answer, like it happens to all of us, doesn't happen or is not given right away, or it's not the answer that I want to hear, but the answer always comes, and maybe you have experienced that in your life. In faith, I believe that she brings my petitions to the Lord and always remind me that I must be open to listen to her son, and as she says to us in the Gospel of John, do whatever he tells you. It is through Mary that I have always felt closer to the Lord, and I have shared that with you already. When discerning the priesthood, she was a big part of that decision, as I always asked her to pray for me, to help me uh, in the steps that I was taking, and to ask her son to show me if this was truly my call. She continues to be the person whom I pray, asking her to to please make me a good priest, who's always who always has in his heart that desire of serving God's people. Maybe sometimes not as well as I desire, but that petition is always there. And of course, I thank the Lord for calling me to the priesthood, for for seeing in me what I never see. But I also thank Mary for for her support, for her help in prayers through the whole process until, until ordination and even up to today. Hence, I had the opportunity to visit the Basilica of Our Lady of Guadalupe soon after the ordination to just simply be there and thank her for her prayers, for her closeness to me, and for always being that compass, if you wish, that leads me to Christ. And recently I visited Haiti, many of you know this, and as I was visiting there, I had the blessing to know many people from the community that we work with. It was, it was indeed a blessing and a wonderful time of seeing people who truly live joy and share joy. However, while in Haiti, I found myself in a place that, where I did not know the culture of the language. Everything was new to me. And even though everything was new for me, it was Mary who reminded me that it does not matter how far I am from home, the Lord is always near. And I came to that realization when um, staying in the hotel, I realized that there was a tiny grotto with Mary, with the statue of Mary. And it was in that place that I truly felt at home. There was something that I knew. The distance and the thousands of miles did not matter at all. That place was home for me. That place was the place where I went to do my prayers. That place where I connected with Christ, but also with the body of Christ. Raising those prayers that I know by heart all those prayers that we all know. And as I was saying, I'm sure that many of you have similar stories in your life, many stories of how Mary has been in your life, how she has carried your prayers to the Lord. And through her, through her intercession, receiving the answer of those prayers. But I believe that before we continue our conversation, about what Mary does, we should focus on what, on who she is. Therefore, I would like to spend the rest of our time together talking about Mary in three different sessions. And I named those sessions in uh, just as follow. The first one, Mary, the daughter of God. The second one, Mary, the mother of God. And the third one, Mary, the mother of the church. And the purpose of dividing this talk in the three parts is to help us understand that Mary is for us more than what she does. 
She is indeed a disciple and a daughter. She is somebody whom the Lord loves. And yes, she is a mother, but also an, an example for us. So as we continue, let us go into this session of Mary, of uh, daughter of God, seeing how she relates to God the Father. <clears throat> I will say that our parents and family members are always the first teachers in our, in, in our faith. And Mary will have had that blessing of having their parents teaching her the faith. We are told through the Evangelion, Proto-Evangelion of James, which is another early Christian text, that Mary's parents were Joachim and Anna. And James shares with us that her parents were people of faith who lived every very devout lives. Mary's faith begins to be strengthened through the example of faith that she sees in her parents. And through them, she begins to learn the story of salvation, that story of salvation that it has been shared with us through the church. She begins to understand that she belongs to a group of people that have been chosen by the Lord. She belongs to the same group of people to whom the Lord has manifested himself in multiple, multiple ways. This same great, same great group of people also help her to know the Lord. She will have participated on the many traditional Jewish feasts, such as the Passover. And as we all know, the Passover is a meal of remembrance of the liberation of God's people from slavery, that slavery that they experienced in Egypt. The families gather in that meal to, to eat the unleavened bread and to basically, through prayers, remember the urgency that the people had to eat and then run away from the city. In this meal, they also have, again, prayers that they observe and the tradition that they carry from generation to the generation. Mary would have been present at the synagogue, listening to the Hebrew scriptures being proclaimed, but also explained. She would also have prayed the Psalms as a way to praise the Lord and keep her heart centered in Him. <clears throat> in my mind, there is no doubt at all that Mary was a young woman whose life was pleasing to the Lord. In the Gospel of Luke, we hear the angel Gabriel saying to her, Hail, favored one, the Lord is with you. The way the angel Gabriel greets Mary lead us to a deeper understanding of the strong relationship that Mary had with God. Mary was not someone who knew of God, but who truly knew God. For her, I think we can say that God was the center of her life. She was chosen to be the mother of the Son of God. But before she was chosen to play that role, she was chosen to be his daughter, to be always with him. And as a daughter of God, Mary shares with all the people the blessing of being part of the chosen race, of the chosen people of God. She shares with the people of God not only a culture, but the faith and the understanding that God is always near, that he's walking with his people, leading his people to salvation. She shares with us the gift of salvation that the Lord offers to humanity through his sacrifice on the cross. And it is because of her strong relationship with the Lord that then she is chosen to be the mother of God. And as the mother of God, we are reminded, as people of God, we are reminded that the Lord has always been close to his people. He has never been a God who created the world and then took an early retirement. Maybe most of us want to do that, but 
the Lord didn't. The love of God for his creation was so much that even after the disobedience of Adam and Eve, he found ways to continue to be present to his people. And this desire of God to be close to his creation is expressed, as we all know, through Abraham, Moses, David, and all the prophets. But in a more powerful way, it's expressed through the sending of his only son. <clears throat> and we hear in the Gospel of Luke once more about the mystery that changed the world. St. Luke narrates that moment as follows. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And of course we knew that Mary had no idea what the angel was talking about. She did not understand completely 100% what the angel was communicating to her. But what is powerful in there is that she trusted in the message. She trusted in the words that the angel shared with her. And her confidence in God led her to surrender herself to God's will and answer with a famous yes. The yes that changed the human history. And she said, as we all know, here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be, do let it be with me according to your word. And I don't know about you, but that was indeed a powerful moment. In that very moment, Mary becomes what the church or the theology calls the Theotokos, the mother of God. And many people throughout the history of the church question this title uh, given to Mary. There was somebody called Nestorius who was the lead in this questioning of this title of Theotokos. And he preferred the title Christotokos, which means the one who gave birth to Christ, placing an emphasis only on the human side of Jesus. Because in his argument, a woman could not give birth to God who is eternal. However, in a sense, his argument denied the unity of the two natures of Jesus, human and divine, and favored only the human nature of Christ. And this questioning resulted <clears throat> in the Council of Ephesus in the year 431, where the church stated, if anyone does not confess that God is truly Emmanuel and that on this account the Holy Virgin is Mother of God, let it be anathema. In other words, when the Son of God came to the world and took flesh, he did not cease to be divine. And Cyril of Alexandria, one of the church fathers, shares with us the following. Only one is the Son. Only one, the Lord Jesus Christ, both before the Incarnation and after the Incarnation. Indeed, the Logos born of God the Father was not one Son, and the one born of the Blessed Virgin another. But we believe that the very one who was born before the ages was also born according, according to the flesh and of a woman. This is to say that there is no division in Christ, but the, humani the, the, the unity of two natures, the human and divine. Therefore, I think we can freely say that Mary is the mother of God. <clears throat> and if you recall, even scriptures points to Mary as the mother of God. Again, in the Gospel of Luke, he tells us that Mary went to visit his cousin Elizabeth. And Mary's cousin was filled with the Holy Spirit and full of joy, she kind of like loudly expresses, Most blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. 
And how does this happen to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Many commentaries tell us that Elizabeth used the title Lord not as one of the political leaders, the king, but she used the title, the title that was referring to God. Therefore, this son that, that is in the womb of Mary is indeed God himself. And as his mother, she dedicated her life to care for him and to protect him, just as all of the mothers that I have none do. And there is a beautiful scene in the movie, um, The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson. I love the way they present Mary, because usually we see Mary in a statue and very holy, and yes, she was. But in the movie, they present Mary as a very human person, as someone who did everything that we do, but someone who knew how to center her heart in the Lord. And in that scene of the movie, we are shown that uh, Mary, at the very moment when she meets with her son on the way to Calvary, in that very moment, she remembers the time when Jesus falls as a child. In the scene, Mary drops the dishes that she was doing and stops washing everything and runs directly to her son to pick him up to check if her son was okay, if he had any cuts or anything. And again, I think that this, this scene truly shows to us the love and dedication of a mother for her son. Truly show us mother in a different way, in a way that we are sometimes not accustomed to see. Her role as mother of God led her to the most inspiring moments of her life. She had the blessing of hearing uh, how Simeon and Anna recognized her son as the son of God. And maybe this was for her a confirmation that her yes truly brought the author of life into the world. As Mary was or played her role as a mother, she desperately looked for him when he stayed behind in the temple. And maybe this has happened to you that you have forgotten to pick up your son or your daughter and then realize that he's left behind. It happened to my mom. We drove away. I mean, we were in the, in the mall and we kept walking and, and our brother was completely lost. We were all desperate, but especially my mom in a very special way. And she started running and looking for him. Mary was there with Christ when he did his first miracle at the wedding at Cana. And in that moment, she trusted in her son. And through her intercession, the public ministry of Christ began. As a mother, Mary was close to her son in his most difficult moments. She was there when he was arrested and condemned to death. Mary saw her son carrying the cross all the way to Calvary, as we mentioned earlier. And she was, as we all know, at the foot of the cross. It was through her suffering that the words of Simeon were fulfilled. Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rise of many in Israel. And to be a sign that will be contradicted, and you yourself, a sword, will pierce Again, what a powerful moment in the life of Christ, in the life of the church, in the life of that history of salvation. And again, Mary's yes changed the course of humanity. But it also changed her life. Mary is now the young woman who is virgin and mother. What a mystery. She is now the young woman who, who cared for the Son of God to gather with Joseph, facing every circumstance and every difficulty that came their way. Mary, the young woman who suffered while seeing her son being crucified. But she, at the same time, is the young woman who rejoiced when the tomb was empty. 
And again, this young woman is whom we call the mother of God, the chosen one, the one that he shows for himself, the one that he loved. But as we all know, and I'm jumping now into the third session, a Mary Mother of the Church, there is another title given to her, and there are plenty, but this title is the Mother of the Church. And Mary received this special role right there while she was at the foot of the cross in her pain, in her suffering. And St. John the Evangelist tells us, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. Again, what a beautiful moment. Most of us in our minds might have say to ourselves or might reflect, I would love to be in that place. I would love to be at the foot of the cross and being able to see the Lord looking at me and telling me and asking me, here is your mother. Take her with you. And in that very moment, at the foot of the cross, there is another yes. The yes of Mary that she gives to the Lord again. In the midst of her pain, a sword pierced her heart, but she accepts her role as the mother of the church. And the congregation of divine worship on the decree, on the celebration of the Blessed Virgin Mary, uh, mother of the church, says to us, Indeed, the mother standing beneath the cross accepted her son's testament of love and welcome all people in the person of the beloved disciple and sons and daughters to be reborn unto eternal life. She thus became the tender mother of the church which Christ begot on the cross handing on the Spirit. In other words, Mary, second yes, as I'm calling it, her second yes, gives birth to the church through the power of the Word of God, who is Christ Himself on the cross, but also through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as Mary cared and protected for her son, she also cares and protects her sons and daughters the church, all of us who are here present, all of us who are joining us virtually, she cares for us. And we see it through her constant present presence with the disciples in the early church. It is powerful to know that after the death of Christ, the death of her son, she doesn't disappear from the life of the church, but she's always there. And proof of this is her presence with the disciples in prayer as they await for the promise of the Holy Spirit to be fulfilled. And we see all that in the first and second chapter of uh, the Acts of the Apostles. In her role as a mother of the church, Mary constantly, constantly comes to our aid. She knows the needs of her sons and daughters, the church, and communicates those needs to her son. This is what we mean when we say that she intercedes for us. We saw it at the wedding at Cana. She identifies the need of the people, the need of all those gathering there, and she basically communicates that to her son. That very action of interceding for the church is connected to the title of queen. And there is an author of the church Brand Petre, who tells us that in the Israelite kingdom, the queen of Israel was not the king's wife, but his mother. And he sa says this in, in a book that he wrote uh, titled Jesus and the Jewish Roots of Mary. He says that it was the role of the queen mother as, uh, to be the intercessor for the people before the king. 
And according to Brand Petre, the Old Testament clearly shows to us that the role of intercessor before the king falls under the responsibility of the mother of the king. And to illustrate this, he quotes in his book um, a, a section, a passage from the, uh, the book of 1 Kings uh, chapter 2, and he quotes some verses. And in that passage we hear, Adonia, son of Haggit, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. Do you come in peace, she asked. In peace, he answered. And he added, I have something to say to you. She said, speak. He said, please ask King Solomon, who will not refuse you, to give me Abishag, the Shunammite, to be my wife. Bathsheba replied, very well, I will speak to the king for you. And if we go on in the story, we hear that that petition was granted. King Solomon heard the intercession that his mother brought to him and granted the prayer or the petition. Mary, as queen of heaven, continues to bring our petitions to her son. I have no doubt of that. As I was saying, in the wedding of Cana, she turns to as in the wedding of Cana, she turns to us and clearly tells us, do whatever he tells you. That's a very difficult thing to do. It's easy for us to come to Mary and say, this is the least of the things that I need, that I want, that I desire. But really hard for us to hear Mary saying to us, do whatever he tells you. But this simply means, I think, brothers and sisters, that we must be open to accept and obey God's will for us just simply by imitating the yes of Mary. A yes that we should be imitating every single day. And there is someone called the Elder Tadeus, who was a member of the Serbian Orthodox Church, who once said, the most holy mother of God prays for us ceaselessly. She's always visiting us. Whenever we turn to her in our heart, she is there. After the Lord, she is the greatest protection for mankind. She is constantly by our side. And all too often, we forget her. This role of intercessor as the queen of heaven is, is constant. It doesn't stop. It's always there. And Mary's love for her son basically leads her to reflect that love through the care of the body of Christ, the church. Hence, the church, through a document that is called Lumen Gentium, says to us, by her maternal charity, she cares for the brethren of her son, who still journey on the earth, surrounded by dangers and difficulties, until they are led into their blessed home. That reminds us that we, I guess, are always covered. Mary, and I truly believe this, Mary for us is a gift and a blessing. A gift given to us at the moment of the cross, at the moment of suffering for her and for Christ. And there's a priest, Mike, the, the one who does the Bible in the church in a year, who was recently saying that the Lord had given everything that he has, his body, his soul, I mean, his body, his blood. The disciples have left him. He has given everything. And the only thing that was his was his mother. And even his mother, on the most painful time of his life, if you wish, he gives away out of love. So I think indeed it's a, it's a gift and a blessing for us to be able to call Mary our mother. And in that cross is what I 
she gives what I call her second yes. And in that moment, she opened this most intimate relationship between his chosen mother and uh, whom he shares with us. The Lord opens that relationship for, for both of for all of us, basically. Therefore, St. Paul, St. Pope, John Paul II reminds us, and I think this is a beautiful quote, that in order to succeed in your intentions, entrust yourself to the Blessed Mary always, but especially in the moments of difficulties and darkness. He continues to tell us, from Mary we learn to surrender to God's will in things. From Mary we learn to trust even when all hope seems gone. From Mary we learn to love Christ, her Son, and the Son of God. Learn from her to be always faithful, to trust that God's word to you will be fulfilled, and that nothing is impossible for God. In other words, trust that through the intercession of Mary, your prayers will be answered. With that, I finished the three sessions, but in this time, I would just like to go to talk a little bit about the apparitions of Mary in a general way. I'm not going deep into um, them, but a very general way that reminds us that she is the hand that leads us to Christ. We have looked at the person of Mary in three different sessions. We discussed Mary as the daughter of God, Mary as the mother of God, and Mary as the mother of the church. Mary, who was chosen by God to bring his son into the world through the most holy mystery of the incarnation, is the same person holy example of discipleship for us. She's also the person who, in love for the church, works to unite her sons and daughters to her son, Jesus Christ. And again, we see it through the many apparitions the church has approved. All these Marian apparitions have something in common. Through them, Mary always points her finger to Christ. And I'm connecting that a little bit with what maybe we can say that Mary is doing the same thing. And we hear in the Gospel of John that John the Baptist says, Look, here is the Lamb of God. And then the two disciples heard him say this, and they follow Jesus. Basically, that's what Mary does. She constantly calls us. Her message is basically to point out to the Lord so that we go in that direction. We can see this clearly through the, <clears throat> through the Guadalupe apparitions. Through these apparitions, Mary brought thousands of people to recognize her son as the one and through God. All of this happened in a very amazing way, a way that we cannot explain. But Mary used at that time the language of the people and everything that they knew. The image of Guadalupe that we know nowadays was basically a living gospel for them. Through the image, they could understand that the moon and the sun were not divine. And this is because they used to worship the sun and the moon. It was communicated to them that she was a virgin, yet a mother. Another mystery that is hard to explain. And it was revealed to them that Jesus, the son that she was expecting, was God himself. And same things happens with Lourdes and Our Lady of Fatima. The message of their apparitions is to remind us of the importance for us to repent and convert, to follow Christ, to look at him, to listen to his word, to live accordingly to his word. She reminds us that we must center our hearts and our whole lives in God. Mary, through her apparition, never ceases to invite us again to follow her son, Christ. 
And as all of you probably have heard, as we planned this evening, we had no idea at all that Pope Francis was going to ask the church to join him in consecrating not only Ukraine and Russia, but the whole world, every single person to Mary, to, her, to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And in his letter to the bishops around the world, Pope Francis said, Now, also in response to numerous requests by the people of God, I wish in a special way to entrust the nations at war to the Blessed Virgin Mary. As I announced yesterday at the conclusion of the Angelus on March 25th, the Solemnity of the Annunciation, I intend to carry out a solemn act of consecration of humanity and Russia and Ukraine in particular to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Again, I think this is I have used this word many times, but I think it's a very powerful moment for the church and the world. Many countries are doing what they can to help the people in Ukraine by welcoming those who, who are basically flee, fleeing their homes in search of safety. And we have seen that through the news. Others are helping those who are still in the field, defending what they know as home. And the church carries with her the most powerful armament and army that she can offer. That is to say, the church offers her prayers in union with the Immaculate Heart of Mary, our intercessor. So let us trust in the power of prayer because Mary says to us today in my mind the same thing that she told the three young children of Fatima. In the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. Now I believe that as we do so, this is not something that we are trying to push the Lord to do, but it's simply a prayer that is uniting us, a prayer that is bringing the world together with the same intention, with the intention of peace, but also not only consecrating to only two places, as we do so, let us be reminded that we are consecrating ourselves as well. When I began this presentation, I shared with you that my purpose was to help us understand Mary as a disciple and daughter of God first. And in doing so, I truly hope you find in her a living example of discipleship. Even though she lived on the earth many years ago under different circumstances, I think Mary teaches us that when we trust in the Lord and place our lives completely to his care, we can also share in his victory, not on our own power, not on our, ter on our own terms, but by the grace of God himself. I think that imitating her discipleship, imitating her yes on daily basis, I think will grant us the grace to one day hear the words of Christ that were directed from the cross to one of the thieves next to him. Amen, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Thank you. Thanks, Father John. It's a nice way to bring us in further into Lent, to reflect on the Holy Mother and her role in the church. And at this time, I'd like to invite a special guest um, with us. Kaylee Perenzino is here to talk about how Mary has been instrumental with the role that Mary has had in her own prayer life. So Kaylee is um, the favorite oldest daughter of Greg and Katrina Perenzino and the favorite oldest sibling of Will, Isabel, and Sophie. She is from the area and has received all her faith formation and sacraments here through the Archdiocese of Baltimore. She studied theology and applied psychology at Boston College and most deeply cherished her time in the St. Joseph's Chapel on campus there. 
After graduating in 2019, she had great hopes of continuing to pursue a higher education degree in theology, and she's ended up doing that with professors who are nine and 10 years old. So she um, was a fourth grade teacher. She spent, I'm sorry, she was spent two years uh, missioned out in Sacramento teaching fourth grade at the St. John Vianney School, and she is currently one of the fourth grade teachers at the Cathedral of Mary Our Queen School. So I'd like to welcome Kelly Piranzino. Thank you. All right, good evening. At Mass a couple weeks ago, I think Father John asked my mom if I would come and give this, uh, or share a little witness talk after Father John's talk tonight. And my mom basically said to me, do whatever he tells you. <laughs> and he's asking you to come, so you're gonna be here tonight. Oh, there's my mom and my sister, how wonderful. Good to see you. Um, <laughs> okay, so I think, as I begin, it's really special to get to share this talk with you uh, before the tabernacle, before the place of highest honor uh, anywhere in our world, in churches all around our world, um, the place where uh, the Blessed Sacrament is kept, where Jesus is. And I'm reminded that the first tabernacle was soft and fleshy and warm and safe for Jesus. Uh, it was Mary's womb. Um, and I think I'm drawn to that mystery a lot as I... Um, as in, when we go into chapel at the cathedral, um, you'll hear fourth grade, we'll talk about how uh, Jesus shows us his deepest love for us and his humility as he reveals himself to us in the Eucharist, as he's fully present in the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And the humble bread contrasts with the most beautiful gold of the tabernacle, the Jesus giving himself to us completely in humility, yet we're trying to give Jesus the best thing that we have, the fanciest, uh, the best in, in the gold of the tabernacle. There's Jesus inside, so humble um, and so available to us. Uh, my friend Caitlin says that, and she's, I've meditated on this a lot, she says that um, Mary is the only person who got to hear Jesus' heartbeat from within her um, as the first tabernacle, the first Christopher, the first Christ bearer. Um, and I'm drawn to imagining that a lot. I'm not a mom, not married, um, but something that's been a great joy in my life lately has been watching dear friends of mine become moms. Um, and I moved at these friends who, in their single life, had the capacity to love deeply. Then when they became engaged and married, their capacities to love expanded through the sacrament of holy matrimony and through their uh, marriages that are rooted in the Lord than yet even more as they've become a mom. Um, I was just talking to my friend Emily. She had her son, Gavin, at the end of July. So he's about eight months old. And she just lit up as she shared that whenever, someone, whenever another human walks in the room, her son just takes utter delight. It's like every time someone walks in the room, he's like, oh, it's a miracle, it's another human. And the way she told it is goofy and joyful, and I'm so moved by Emily's capacity to delight, um, and I'm so moved by her capacity to connect so deeply and have such a deep bond with a human who can't yet communicate with her in words. And I think about if Emily can delight so deeply in her son, how, what's Mary's capacity for delight, and what are all the things that Mary got to hold and tuck into her heart and uh, the years that, in um, the moments where maybe not much is recorded in the Bible, but what are the things that Mary saw um, in Jesus? And maybe if you ask fourth grade some of these things, their answers would range from uh, Jesus tumbling and doing somersaults for the first time, and Jesus spilling his glass of water all over the floor, and Mary going to clean it up, and Jesus doing flip tricks on his scooter, and wanting to show Mary and Joseph, and uh, the for imagination of fourth grade is is incredible. Um, I think about all these things that Mary could store up in her heart as she watched Jesus. Um, and then I think about, as Father John said, during this Lent, I've been especially drawn to Jesus' words on the cross that he gave us his best gift, the, maybe the last thing that he had and the last thing that he could give, but also his best gift. He entrusted us with his mother. Um, 
And I think about all the things in each of our own lives, Mary's capacity to delight in us as we grow, as we grow closer to her son, Jesus. I think about all the ways that Mary stores up with great delight, just sheer delight in us, all the, the times, all the moments of our days where we pull out our rosary beads and we're really tired before bed and we get three Hail Marys in and we fall asleep and there we are. We tried our rosary that day. Um, I think about all the times that uh, just Mary must delight in moms and, and dads and families who get all their kids clothed and out the door for church and maybe they've got two different socks and kids are wearing parkas and it's the middle of July but here they are they're in the pew ready for mass um, I think about Mary's capacity to uh, delight in in my own life um, both in seasons of difficulty and in um, seasons of joy too I relate to my friend Emily as a new mom because I've been a new teacher these past years. And sometimes as a teacher, or often I find that everything is amazing to me. The things that kids say to you, the things that happen in your day. My day starts where the kids come in at 7.45. And at 7.45 and 42 seconds, I have a kid in my face telling me about her swim practice last night and how she read, how she swam a couple 300s and then 200s. And then they did some work on the land. And it was a lot. And she's exhausted, but she did her math homework anyway. And she just got a palate expander. So everything with an S puts a little bit of moisture on my face. And I'm ready then for 7.46 when another kid comes in the room and he's just built his Lego set that his grandparents made a special trip to New Jersey to get him and bring back to Maryland. And he is so excited. His mom emailed me a picture and he wants to know if I checked my email yet to see the picture. Then 747 comes and something else. There's another story. There's something else to behold. Uh, and my prayer can often just, there's two simple prayers that help me a lot in my daily life. Mary, be a mother to me now. I think that's borrowed from Mother Teresa. I'm sure the other one's borrowed too, but it's just, Mary, lend me your heart. And when I'm feeling like, okay, I just need a minute to take a breath, to take a contact with these kids who want to share things, or there's things going on that need my attention, Mary, lend me your heart. Because Mary's expansive capacity for delight is something that I draw from often. I teach at the school of uh, Cathedral of Mary, our queen, and that title is most fitting because Mary is the queen of heaven. She's the queen of all the saints. Um, but I love... I love St. Therese's words that she's more a mother than a queen. Uh, yeah, because it's true. And the more I think about it, the more I, I love the title, Cathedral of Mary, our queen. But I, I just feel like I teach at the school of Mary, our mom. And I don't think that will ever be published in print. But that's what's <laughs> stamped on, on so many of our hearts there. Um, and I'm grateful as I've been overwhelmed by the world so often in the past couple of years by the magnitude of suffering by, and continually by the magnitude of suffering, the magnitude of peoples around the world who are in flight, fleeing from terror, fleeing from um, just violence and war-torn areas, trying to protect their families, seeking food, seeking shelter, seeking community. Um, and everything can feel so big because it is, and so overwhelming because it is. Um, and then I think about my role as a teacher in forming kids to know the Lord and to preach the gospel with their lives and to pray and love and study and serve and, and do everything for the greater glory of God. I think about this magnitude of this task entrusted to me, and my heart gets overwhelmed so often. And I imagine all of you, with all that you hold in your lives, you hold so much, you do so much, you're... Uh, you have great roles in people's lives, and people expect you to show up in big ways for them. Um, and I, I'm so grateful for Mary because she so often, sometimes she can seem so, I mean, she's the queen of heaven. She's sinless. She's without sin. She's uh, kept her word. She not only said yes to God and gave the perfect yes to God, um, but she kept her word, and she never went back on her word. Um, and we all have so much to learn from her. Um, but it's Mary's attentiveness to, to littleness um, that maybe I, I want to share with you most today for the last couple of minutes. Um, that Mary's capacity for littleness um, is important because no matter how old we are, no matter uh, what we've been through in life, no matter how this road of Lent is going for us, 
Uh, Mary always has a place for us in her heart. Um, and I want to share the words. I got this prayer card from confession a couple months ago, and when the priest, when Father Jeremy at Immaculate Conception gave it to me, it moved me to tears because she's got St. Juan Diego here all wrapped up right on her heart uh, so tenderly. Um, and I'm reminded of the words that she spoke to St. Juan Diego in uh, the year 1531. And this translation reads, listen, put it into your heart, my littlest child, that the thing that frightened you, the thing that afflicted you is nothing. Do not let it disturb you. Am I not here, I who am your mother? Are you not under my shadow and my protection? Am I not the source of your joy? Are you not in the hollow of my mantle, in the crossing of my arms? Do you need something more? Uh, and I just, I love when uh, I've prayed with, with these words and when fourth grade wrote them out in their sweet fourth grade handwriting, the word that I kind of was drawn to in reflection again and again was the word littlest. Uh, like put it in your heart, like tuck it, tuck it right in here, my littlest child, for this moment right now, for the moment when you need it later in the week, for down the road, for after that long day at work, for that morning where it's hard to get out of bed, for uh, that, that cross that you're carrying, like just put it in your heart. And if she's saying to Juan Diego, who then would later build the basilica where the, his tilma um, to Our Lady of Guadalupe is uh, housed and is kept, uh, if he's her littlest child, then I think that makes room for us there, too, that we're also Mary's little children, and she has room for us. Uh, the same way that she had room for Jesus when uh, he was mere moments old, um, and she had room for him to grow inside her, uh, Mary, too, has room for us to nurture us, to strengthen us as we grow closer to Christ. When Jesus says, behold your mother, he give us his best gift in giving us his mom. Uh, and this Lent, I invite us to think about the places in our lives where, uh, well, a couple things, the places in our lives where uh, maybe we don't feel worthy of Christ's best gift, where we don't feel worthy that Mary's available to us, that her motherhood is available to us, too. I invite you to think about the moments where uh, maybe, maybe in your heart, there, the moments where Mary delights in you. I think it's so important. I don't think we think about it enough that Mary just takes sheer delight in us. Um, the other day, I had, or a couple months ago, this, this, this is a couple months ago, I had given my students, they had written their first five paragraph essays and they're fourth graders, so it's their first, maybe their first five paragraph essay that they've ever written in their school career. And to celebrate, I played Celebrate by Cool and the Gang, and I had them dance up and turn in their papers. And I look up, and there they all are. They've gotten up on their chairs. I hope my principal doesn't hear this. They're all dancing and having the best time. They're like, we did it. We turned in our essays. And then I'm like, all right, five, four, three, two, get down, sit down. And I just thought in that moment about Mary's sheer capacity as a mom to delight. Um, and I invite you to think about those moments, too, where your heart is expanded to delight in the presence of God in your midst, uh, the places where God is present, that um, our little corners of the world are in the unexpected places, just like where he appeared in Mary. It was unexpected and revolutionary, and it changed the entire course of the world. Over to my right is a painting of the Annunciation of Mary. It's painted by Henry Osawa Tanner, and the original is in the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, and when I went there with my family this summer, I got to see it for the first time. Um, that wasn't the first time I saw the painting, though. The first time I saw the painting was in California in my principal's office. And I moved out to California unsure about my yes to teaching, but grateful for the opportunity to have 27 little souls entrusted to me who I'd get to walk with for my two years there. In her, my principal, Amy's office, uh, was this painting, and this painting gave me strength on often really difficult days, days where 
the art of teaching felt far from being learned. My students' needs far surpassed my capacity to provide tenderness and patience and uh, attentiveness. Um, and often I felt like I was uh, just falling short of my own desire to love my students well. And I knew that the task at hand uh, just like for for all of us, the task of loving well um, is far is beyond us. We need Jesus, and uh, as we rely on Jesus, Jesus gives us His best gift and His mother too to help us on our way. And so, this little painting in the office um, brought me so much, uh, just brought so much room in my heart for meditation on Mary's own yes to Angel Gabriel, and. It's, I know it's far away, but when you zoom in, if you come up and take a look up close, uh, her hands are clasped in her lap, and she's got lots of cloths kind of folded and wrapped up around her, and she's looking with maybe awe and maybe a little bit of kind of apprehension or wonder at what's happening before her. The only light in the painting is coming from the angel, and it's casting the light. It's illuminating Mary in the moment as she's preparing to say her yes, to give her, be it done to me according to thy word. And one day I was looking at this painting. I'd looked at it often, and uh, my principal, who I know that Mary gave to me on behalf of my mom to take care of me while I was in Sacramento, um, and I called her Sacra Mama, and I was told when I got out there that yeah, Amy's a great principal. She'll help you grow as a teacher, no doubt, but she's an even better mom. I'm so glad you're going to the St. John Vianney School. And I know that my mom gave her to me because my mom would, or my mom prayed for her, my mom's prayers for that time are, um, I think my principal was a fruit of, of her prayers because my mom prayed that I'd be taken care for and that I'd be sustained by God in my work um, and that I'd be able to grow in my capacity to love. Um, and one day in the, when I was looking at this painting, Amy said to me, you know why I love that painting so much? I said, why? She said, because I, in, Mary, in the way Mary's looking in her, I can see you and your little yes here that's been so floppy, so, so messy. So many days where I'd go in her office and I'd be like, I don't know what just happened for the last seven hours, but it was a lot. Can you help me? And she would talk me through. She'd help guide me in loving better and better meeting the needs of my students. And I invite each of you today, as we prepare tomorrow for the Solemnity of the Annunciation, to find yourself within the painting. And maybe you're like, I'm a 70-year-old man. <laughs> My hair is a little different. I don't know if that's going to work. But, but not like that, but just in the way of maybe your hairlines don't match. But I hope that you can see yourself in Mary in, the, in your own yeses to our Lord that you're giving each day. Um, and that you can see yourself too. Um, in, in the yeses, um, the ways the Lord has asked you to say yes, the things that you've said yes to, the people that you've said yes to, um, and that tomorrow's Annunciation can be just a great celebration for us of not only Mary's yes, but then the successive yeses that we get to give um, to continue to allow Christ to be born in our world. So as we conclude, I brought the same prayer that Father John started with, the Memorare, so I thought we could pray that. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O virgins of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in your mercy, hear and answer me. Amen. Mary, be a mother to me now. Mary, lend us your heart. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you. Kaylee, thank you so much. It was very powerful for us to hear um, your special devotion to Mary. Um, I'd like to take just a couple minutes to see if there are any questions for either Kaylee or Father John. No? Okay. 
Um, while I hope tonight has been a great um, a way for you to grow closer to Mary and to our Lord through Mary, and also a way to help kind of um, encourage us in this Lenten journey, um, I, a couple of things I'd like to, um, just reminders, tomorrow, as Father John mentioned, at 1230 here, we will be playing the rosary as the Pope consecrates Russia and the Ukraine and the world to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Um, Fridays, uh, tomorrow, as every Friday in Lent, uh, 1.30 and 7 o'clock, we have Stations of the Cross. Um, 8 o'clock, they're in um, Stations in Spanish. Our next presentation, our last one for the Lenten season, is next Thursday, 7 o'clock here with Father Rick, our pastor. He'll be presenting on the Passion Narratives of the Gospels. Um, two opportunities for adoration before Lent is over, um, Friday, April 1st for First Friday, and then Thursday, April 7th, we have a full day of reconciliation and adoration from 9 to 9. And then I invite Father John for closing prayer. Well, again, before we conclude in prayer, thank you for being here. Thank you for uh, taking some time of, 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 your, of your day and just to come and reflect and maybe not so much know more about Mary, but to be reminded of who Mary is for us and, and in our life. So, and today I would like to finish with the uh, prayer that this, the colic prayer for the uh, Blessed Virgin Mary image and mother of the church uh, mass. So... Again, let us be reminded that whatever we go, we, we are always in that presence of God who is always near with us. O oh God, Father of mercies, whose only begotten Son, as he hung upon the cross, shows the blessed Virgin Mary, his mother, to be our mother also. We pray that with her loving help, your church may be more fruitful day by day, and exulting in the holiness of her children, may draw to her, embrace all the families of the people. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. I hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you. <laughs>